Hi everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for clicking on today's video and I hope you guys stay tuned until the end. My name is Esther Vincent, also known as Leah Mia on social media. Do follow me over there. Would love to catch you guys up. How have you guys been doing? How has things going on around you guys, wherever you're staying? Well, I hope everything is going good and you guys are staying safe. Have you guys checked out my previous video titled Mimaland? Well, what is Mimaland, you ask? Mimaland was Malaysia's first ever theme park, but now it is in an abandoned, mysterious stage. Well, what had happened? To find that out, do visit my previous video. I will have the link down below on the description box, or you guys could wait until the end of this video. Um, the particular pop-up would show up. You guys know what to do. Click on it and watch that video. Thank you. Now, as for today, I've got a serious story, a serious topic, a serious incident that had taken place in my country, Malaysia. This is an incident, a crime that no one wish would happen anywhere around the world. Unfortunately, it does happen. It does take place. And this is a brutal crime that shook Malaysia and it is still unsolved till today. So I thought I would share it here with you guys. As per the title of this video, this is the story of Nurin Jaslin, a young child abducted, sexually abused, and finally murdered. Nurin Jaslin Binti Jazimin, an eight-year-old Malaysian girl born on the 11th of September 1999. She was the second child out of four sisters. Their parents were Jazimin Abdul Jalil, the father, and the mother Nurazian Bistaman. It was a normal day, just like any other on the 20th of August 2007 in a humble flat at Section 1 Wangsamaju, Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. The eight-year-old Nurin Jaslin, a jet black-haired girl, was all set up to go to the night market, which is like a stone away from her house. Night market is a very common thing in Malaysia where, you know, they just have hundreds of stalls selling everything from finger food to clothings. So it's where a lot of Malaysians, we do go, it's at night as per its name, Night Market. So a lot of people visit Night Market. We just get, you know, a lot of things to eat and even stuff for home. So it's a, it's a very common thing. As for Nurin Jaslin, she was all excited to go to the Night Market because she has been eyeing on some of her favorite hair clips. Like I mentioned, she has jet black hair, she has long hair, and she loves to accessorize her hair with hair clips. She was sick to love hair clips so much that she has hundreds of them and she collects them. So yeah, that night she basically wanted to go to the night market to get herself some new hair clips. Um, it was also confirmed by her best friend. She has like one best friend in school and even her best friend knows that Nurin loves hair clips. Norazian, Nurin's mom, would later say that Nurin would normally go to the night market with her elder sister. But this particular night, the elder sister could not make it. But Nurin had been all excited throughout the whole day. From morning, she had been asking permission from her mom to visit the night market to get her hair clips. So the mom didn't want to disappoint her, would allow Nurin to go to the night market all alone. This one decision though would prove to be fatal later that night. So the time passes by and it was getting late and Nurin does not return home. Now the worried mom starts to go down to the night market and ask around the stalls over there, especially the stalls that sell hair accessories, asking them whether a small child like hers, Nurin, has come down to their shop had they seen a young child, you know, showing Nurin's picture, she asked around and each and every stall owner mentioned that they did not see her child in the night market or coming to their stall. This sort of proves that Nurin didn't even reach the night market that particular night because if she had gone to the night market, she would have stopped in either one of the stalls and the owners of the stall would have recognized her because she was a regular. She always comes down 
to their stall to get you know clips and whatnot so each of them said they didn't see that girl that night which proves that she did not reach the night market that particular night this worried the mom even more then she tried to search all around the whole area like you know their flat area the area beside their house they searched all over and Nureen was nowhere to be found finally Jasmin and Nurizan, Nureen's parents went to the nearest police station and filed a missing person report and the investigation started this started a nationwide search for this missing child led by the authorities and some other organizations, including some NGOs and the mainstream media. At a very early stage of the investigation, the police were able to get a very good lead from Nureen's cousin who lives in the same area as them. This cousin, I could not find out whether it's a he or a she, so throughout the video, I will mention the cousin as the cousin, all right? This cousin happened to be in the same night market that night, and he or she saw a young man to be in his 20s standing outside of the night market area by a white van. Soon after, when Noreen was passing by that man, he grabbed onto Noreen and tried pulling her into that white van. The cousin mentioned that Noreen was seen struggling and saying no, no, while being forcefully pulled into that van by that young man. At that time, the cousin didn't think much of it because uh, the person, the cousin thought that it might be someone that Nureen knew and they are trying to bring Nureen back to her home. So they just didn't say anything. This lead, this information concluded that Nureen was not just missing, but was abducted as well. Now it has been 13 days since Nureen went missing and a journalist in the hopes of helping the family recommended Jasmin, the father, to enlist the help of hypnosis forensic expert Dr. Sazali Ahmad to try and attract Noreen's uh, location using remote viewing. For you people who do not know what is remote viewing, it's a scientific technique developed by the U.S. military intelligence to gather information about a target, like what they are doing or where are they located and stuff like that. Cool, right? Like, I didn't know something like this existed until now. I feel it's so cool because someone from here can connect with a different person completely in a different location just by using the connection of the mind. Like, wow, that's, that's something. It is said that it's sort of like hypnosis, but I do not know how reliable it is. When I Google it up, it mentioned that there is a lot of mixed reactions to it, but uh, Noreen's family did try it out. So this Dr. Sazali, the person who is uh, conducting this remote viewing session, he is a forensic expert and he also has an academy that trains people who are interested in learning this remote viewing um, thing. So four individuals went through this remote viewing session, which was Noreen's mom, Nureen's cousin, the one that saw Nureen being dragged into the white van, uh, Nureen's best friend, and another completely different individual, but it's a person that is practicing remote viewing in Dr. Sazali's academy. Nureen's mom, Norazian, was the first to go through this process of remote viewing, and Dr. Sazali was able to get her into a semi-conscious realm and she was able to connect with Nureen. She saw Nureen in a very dark room, lying on the floor in a fetal position. At this stage, Dr. Sazali ordered Nureen's mom to leave the room that Nureen was in and to see the area around to locate where Nureen was located. But she being a mom, after seeing her daughter in such a weak, terrible stage, she could not take her sight off her daughter. Hence, 
her process went to a fail where she was not able to allocate where Nureen was. Now the cousin went as the second person into the remote viewing session and this time he or she was able to get a little bit more information than the mother. At first, the cousin saw almost the same thing where Noreen was in a very dark room, uh, lying on the floor in a fetal position, sort of shivering. So the doctor ordered the cousin to leave the room and try to see where the location is. The cousin does just that. The cousin was able to see a road which looked very familiar and it was surrounded by trees and the cousin was able to see that there is a very tall building in the midst of construction. Unfortunately, the cousin fails to trace the road's name or anything specific for the authorities to take as a lead. Now, the doctor's student went as the next person into the remote viewing process. The student was able to see everything that uh, the cousin saw, which is the road that looked very familiar and the trees, but the student got a little bit more information than the cousin. The student was able to see that the location has a lot of stores and stalls around it. And as for Noreen, she was seen in the same position, on a fetal position, on the floor in a very dark room. That poor girl had her hands bounded and she was shivering in pain and fever. This time, the students saw two men together with Noreen in the room. And one of the men seemed to have like a very strong figure. The other one seemed to be a thin person but to be looking like a Malaysian. The second person, the thin person's feature looks to be like of a Malaysian. Few other remote viewing sessions were conducted. Unfortunately, the connection with uh, Nureen was getting weaker and weaker because of her state that she is getting weaker and weaker day by day because of whatever torture that she is going through by her uh, abductors. So the connections finally was not being able to go through because Noreen was completely weak and her mind is no longer you know, functioning, I would say. Poor girl. Various parties came up announcing that reward would be given to anyone who could provide information, uh, valid information, that would help to allocate the missing child. At the beginning, the reward came up to about 18,000 Malaysian ringgit, but soon after, about 25 days after Nureen's abduction, it had hiked up all the way to 26,000 to 30,000 Malaysian ringgits. 17th September 2007, almost a month after Nureen's abduction. Cheng Yen Feng found a blue and black sports bag outside of her working premises in Pataling Jaya. This is about to be 16 kilometers away from where Noreen was last seen. She didn't inspect that bag at that time, thinking that it belongs to her manager who had just returned from Singapore. Jack Yo, the manager, confirms with the employee that found the bag, saying that the bag indeed does not belong to him. So he goes in to inspect what's inside the bag. And when he opens it up, he finds a pair of legs. That's when he freaks out and calls the cops immediately. The police arrives at once and after further inspection of the body, it would be identified to be of a young girl aged between six to nine. A post-mortem revealed the child had bruises all over the body, especially the top part on the hands and around the neck, which indicated that she might have been strangled to death. Worst of all, the coroner also found a cucumber and eggplant stuffed into the young victim's genitals. Nureen's parents were called in to identify the victim, but after seeing the victim, they denied that it is their daughter as the victim's body and face was severely deformed due to the torture or whatever that the child went through. So the parents just could not identify the body. Unfortunate for them, later on a DNA test would reveal that this victim, the body, is indeed Nureen Jaslin. 
Nuren's violent torture and death sparked an uproar throughout the entire nation. An immediate full-scale hunt to find who's responsible for this child's murder started. Adding to the parents' sorrows, some wanted to charge uh, Nurin's parents with negligence, saying that it was their fault that she was abducted. Um, they should have not allowed her to go out alone in the first place and stuff. Lucky enough for Jazimin and Nurizan, Nurin's parents, that majority of the citizens and ministers shun this idea, so they were not charged. Come to think about it, I don't think so any parents would want their child to go through such a torture. Like nobody thinks things like this would happen to their child. You know, it was just that one night Nurizam, Nurin's mom might have thought, you know, she's just gonna go down, get her clips, and she's gonna come back up. That would have been the only thing in her mind. And that one small little mistake sometimes, sometimes proves to be fatal later on. So I don't know. This is just something that nobody could judge, you know? It's just something because even I, when I was young, I've gone like many different blocks. I've walked, gone to the shop to get myself some snacks and stuff. So the parents were not charged. The main issue here is not about punishing the parents, but how the police and the public could come together to try to find or try to catch, arrest those individuals who are responsible in committing such a heinous crime, said the then vice chairman of Malaysian Crime Prevention Foundation, Tan Sri Lee Lam Thai. Eventually, on the 28th of September 2007, five individuals, four men and one woman, was arrested in connection to Nurin's case. The woman was released after some interrogation, while the four men were remanded in the police custody for the next seven days. But later on, those four men were released as well due to lack of evidence. Now, with no clues and leads to move, police opened up the reward system again, rewarding 10,000 Malaysian ringgits to anyone who could provide any information, any lead, any valid, valid information, valid lead at all in regards to Noreen's perpetrator. And the reward pool even increased when a private business owner offered to add in another 10,000 ringgit, but wished to be anonymous. On the 11th of October 2007, the police released a CCTV footage enhanced with the help of the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, which showed a man carrying a Diodora gym bag, the same bag that contained the remains of Nurin, and leaving that bag at the particular place which it was later found. The footage would also show a woman in red and three other men lurking around the area where the bag was dropped off. They were seen roaming around the area with a car um, before and after the bag was left there. Despite the enhanced CCTV footage, the video was still not clear enough to see the man's face and the license number plate of the motorcycle that the man used to drop off that particular gym bag, which contained Nurin's remains. So basically, nobody's face was visible, no car or number plate, I mean the license plate of the car or the motorcycle was visible. So nobody was a suspect and nobody was caught. <sighs> Poor girl such a young age, such an unfair death, and nobody caught, like no justice. This is just very unfair. Three months after Noreen's death, her uncle, Jasni Abdul Jalil, with a few others, drafted a proposal in December 2007 to create an alert known as the Nationwide Urgent Response Information Network, Noreen Alert. 
This idea was based on the United States Broadcasting Emergency Response, also known as the Amber Alert, the system that was created after the kidnapping and the murder of nine-year-old Amber Hagerman in Texas of 1996. Noreen Alert became the first step to creating Talian Noor, the hotline that enables early intervention for missing children in Malaysia. As of 2018, Noreen's father, Jazimin, had urged the police to reopen Noreen's uh, case so that they can try investigation again with the latest technologies so that they could find who was the perpetrator who is responsible for his daughter's death. But his pleas were not granted and Noreen's case still stays to this day as an unsolved case. It has been 14 years since the loss of Noreen and this incident stays as a grisly reminder inside of each parent's, each guardian's mind to always have an eye on your little ones. Just don't let them go anywhere alone, you know? Just, just don't take the chance. Don't take the chance. We don't want to regret later, so it's best that we have them right where we can see them and not suffer this sort of consequences because it can be really bad, really, really bad. Oh God, it's very scary. As for me though, I wish, pray, and hope that Noreen's family, her siblings, her parents, somehow get a closure, they get a healing from such a traumatic incident, such a traumatic part of their life. I just hope they get a closure because without getting a closure, sometimes such a simple issue in our lives and we don't get closure to it, we get a little bit crazy. This is a huge traumatic incident and I just hope they get closure one day. As for the young soul, Nurin Jaslin Jazimin, I hope her soul rests in peace. That, you guys, is the case of Nurin Jaslin Jazimin, a poor young eight-year-old soul abducted, sexually abused, and finally murdered. It's just very unfair, very unfortunate. It's just very sad, especially when there's no closure. You know, it's, it's just completely sad when it's a crime story because there's a victim involved and, you know, when there's a murder or a life is taken, their family, their loved ones, their friends, all of them are involved and it's just very sad. If any of you viewers are Malaysians, same age as me, or you know, a little older than me, a little younger than me, you guys would have definitely known this case because this case was all over the news throughout Malaysia. And if you guys have any theories of your own, do let me know. I would love to hear that in the comment section. With all that said and done, we have come to the end of today's video. If you guys had stayed tuned until now, I thank you guys so much. That means a lot to me. If you guys loved or liked this video, do leave me a thumbs up. That would mean a lot to me as well. That is all I have for you guys today. I will see you all soon in a next video. Wherever you are, be safe, take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye!